Hi, thank you for joining the Nisqually River Education Project and the Nisqually Tribe for our salmon tossing events. My name is Lane and I'm the Environmental Education AmeriCorps member for the Nisqually River Education Project. Today, I'll be taking you through what to expect for salmon tossing, a little background on the practice and the species of the salmon that we have in the Nisqually watershed. Before we begin, I'd like to start off with a land acknowledgement. Let's remember that much of this watershed monitoring is being done on the traditional and ancestral lands of the Nisqually people, or Squally Obj. Squally Obj means people of the river, people of the grass. They have inhabited and stewarded these lands since time immemorial. The Nisqually tribe continues to lead the fight for salmon recovery in the Nisqually and the greater Puget Sound region. The Nisqually tribe continues to restore and celebrate their culture through revival of their language and traditions. Without the tribe, salmon recovery would not be possible, so we want to pay homage to and highlight the incredible work they continue to do. Now, let's refamiliarize ourselves with the salmon life cycle. Salmon are an anadromous species, meaning they start in freshwater, migrate to the ocean, and return to freshwater to spawn and die. They start out as eggs in freshwater, then transform to alvin, then to fry, still in freshwater. Smolting starts when the fry moves downstream, eventually through estuaries where physiological changes, like the silvering of color, occurs. They finish maturing in the ocean, where they spend one to seven years, depending on the species, and finish off their journey back upstream to the same place that they were born. Let's explore each of these stages a little more. So starting off, we have eggs. Female salmon create four to five nests, or also known as reds, and deposit roughly 1,000 eggs per red. Female salmon typically lay 3,000 to 5,000 eggs, depending on the species. The eggs rely off the nutrients from the egg sacs and the water around them to survive. Next up, we have alvin. Once the egg hatches, at this stage, the salmon are called alvins, and they live on the stream bottom, feeding from the yolk sac attached to their undersides. When the yolk sac is, de is depleted, alvins must find food quickly. Up next, we have a fry. Between 20 to 100 eggs survive to become juvenile salmon, or fry. The fry emerge from the stream bottom and begin searching for insects to eat. Depending on their species, fry may spend hours or years in freshwater before beginning their journeys to the ocean. They are often a darker co color than smolts. This is a smolt. As you can see, it's about double the size of a fry, and it tends to silver up or lose color. This helps it blend in to the ocean environment more. Transitioning to saltwater in estuaries prepares the smolt for ocean life. Estuaries are places where saltwater meets freshwater. When a salmon fry enters an estuary, their bodies begin to adapt to the saltwater, a process that's called smoltification. The length of time it takes a salmon to adjust to saltwater depends on the species. When the process is complete, salmon head into the open ocean. So, what species of salmon are found in the Nisqually watershed? We have five species, coho, steelhead, chum, chinook, and pink salmon. Let's explore these species a little bit more. Up first, we have the coho. Coho are also known as silver salmon. In the ocean, they have small black dots on their back and tail. Spawning salmon in freshwater are dark maroonish color on the sides. Adult coho are around 8 to 12 pounds and 24 to 30 inches long. Let's explore some historical coho runs. Pre-1800s, we had about 23,000 coho salmon per year in the Nisqually watershed. And in 2020, with a combined hatchery and wild salmon numbers, we had 9,243. Numbers for the 2020 data were provided by the Nisqually tribe, and for coho include both wild and hatchery raised salmon. 4,768 of these were hatchery raised, whereas 4,475 are from the wild. So there's about a 50-50 split between hatchery raised coho salmon and wild. Up next, we have chum. 
sometimes referred to as a dog salmon. This is one of the largest species of Pacific salmon and can grow up to 3.6 feet and around 30 to 35 pounds. In the ocean, they're bluish greenish with black spots on their back. When spawning, they develop stripes of black and red along their sides. Males develop canine-like fangs, which are mostly used for competing with other males for the rights to reproduce with a female. Here are some historical chum runs. Pre-1800s, there were 60,000 to 100,000 chum salmon in the Nisqually watershed. And in 2020, there were only 12,722. All of these chum were wild salmon, so none of them were hatchery raised. Moving on now to the pink salmon. Pink salmon have a unique two-year life cycle, meaning in the Puget Sound, salmon runs only happen during odd years. They are the smallest of the Pacific salmon, weighing in around three to five pounds on, and an average length of 20 to 25 inches. In the ocean, pink salmon are a blue-green color on the top with silver on the sides and a white belly. Spawning males become dark on the back with red and green-brown blotches on the sides. Males will also develop a large hump on their back, which females do not develop. They only spend a short amount of time in the freshwater compared to other salmon species. Now some historical pink runs. Pre-1800s, there were 115,000 pink salmon in the Nisqually watershed. And remember, this is only in odd years. In 2019, there were 425,527 pink salmon. All of these were wild salmon. Next up, we have the Chinook, also known as king salmon. This is the largest of the Pacific salmon species. They can grow up to 4.9 feet and 130 pounds, but are more often around three feet and 30 pounds. In the ocean, they are blue green on the top and silver on the sides. Chinook have a black pigment along their gums, which differentiates them from other species. Spawning Chinook salmon change to an olive, green, or brown color, and can often be red or purplish as well. Males also have a hooked upper jaw, which helps them compete with other males for females. Now the historical Chinook runs. Pre-1800s, there were only about 5,000 Chinook salmon in the Nisqually watershed. And in 2020, there was a combined hatchery and wild salmon run amount of 7,646, though only 651 were wild, meaning almost 7,000 of these 2020 totals were hatchery raised. And up last, we have the steelhead. Steelhead is technically a trout, not a salmon, but it is still anadromous, though some steelhead live their whole lives in freshwater and are a subspecies called rainbow trout. Steelheads can grow up to 45 inches and weigh over 30 pounds, though most are about 20 inches and weigh 8 pounds. And here we have the steelhead historical runs. Pre-1800s, there were about 6,000 steelhead in the Nisqually watershed. And in 2020, there were 1,172. All of these are wild salmon. So here are some graphs that compare current salmon runs with historical salmon runs. As you can see, current salmon runs are significantly lower than what historical salmon runs used to be in the Nisqually watershed. There is an overall downward trend in population, but what we can see in the, with the pink salmon here is that it's a bit of an outlier. With a bigger population in 2019 than pre-1800s. You might ask, why might their populations be increasing while other salmon populations are de decreasing? Well, pink salmon mainly spawn in lower river stretches where they're less impacted by urban, urban development, and they don't spend an extended period of time in the harsh freshwater environments. They rather spend more time in the ocean where there are greater food sources. We also see that Chinook numbers are slightly increasing compared to the pre-1800s. Chinook are considered a threatened species, so why does it appear that their population today is greater than it was pre-1800s? A large majority of the Chinook population returns that we see are actually hatchery-raised fish. 
less than one-seventh of the total population for 2020 were wild salmon. One of the goals that we share with the tribe's hatchery is to increase wild Chinook populations so we don't have to rely on just hatchery raised. So why might we be seeing a downward trend overall in salmon populations, and why is this an issue? Things like development, population increase, pollution, habitat loss, lack of food, and a decrease in the dissolved oxygen all impact salmon survivability. Lots of species, including humans and especially tribal communities, rely on salmon as a food source. Salmon are very sensitive to pollution and environmental degradation. So the more of these issues that we see, the less salmon populations we're going to find. So let's talk about Chinook and steelhead. These are considered a threatened species. Threatened species is one that is likely to become endangered in the foreseeable future. Many of the protections under the Endangered Species Act are provided to threatened species, but not all of them, whereas all of the protections are provided to endangered species. Some steps we can take to prevent Chinook and steelhead from becoming an endangered species are continue to monitor water quality, protect habitat, clean out pollution from streams, and minimize future pollution, as well as addressing groundwater runoff issues. The goal of tossing salmon back into the river is to bring marine-derived nutrients upstream. Spawning salmon bring with them a lot of nutrients from the ocean that other species depend on. Pre-development salmon would naturally be able to swim closer to the headwaters to spawn and die, but because of dams, stream redirection, development, etc., they can't make it up that far, leaving it a low nutrient system. Our salmon tossing trips will follow the natural salmon cycle of winter months. So usually in the winter, we would naturally find a sea salmon further upstream. Since this isn't able to happen naturally, we must toss salmon into the upper reaches of the river to provide it with essential nutrients. So why do we toss salmon carcasses? Well, first, baby salmon have been known to eat decaying salmon carcasses. This provides good nutrients and helps them survive. Along with baby salmon, benthic macroinvertebrates are also known to survive off of decaying salmon carcasses. The salmon will then in turn grow up and eat the benthic macroinvertebrates and the circle of life continues. We also toss salmon carcasses to benefit the trees and plants. 18% of nitrogen or plant food is marine derived, meaning that when salmon travel back up the freshwater streams and die, they bring with them lots of nutrients from the ocean. Nitrogen is essential for plants and helps them grow. We don't toss salmon just for other species though. It also has a benefit to us. This quote from David Trout says, a state report notes that commercial and recreational fishing alone in Washington is estimated to support 16,000 jobs and $540 million in personal income. Salmon carcasses provide nutrients for many species, which makes it easier for more populations to survive and grow. The more young fish that make it to maturity there are, equals the more fish for humans to catch. Fishing is important to many tribal nations, including the Nisqually tribe, and helps support the lifestyle of many people. The presence of salmon in these streams are part of the cultural and spiritual traditions of the Nisqually people. Salmon is not only a staple of the diet for the Nisqually people, but also a huge part of their culture. Restoring salmon populations is an essential step in regaining food, food sovereignty for the tribe. Food sovereignty is about preserving the right to hunt, fish, gather, and grow healthy and culturally significant foods while providing stewardship of the earth. So why do we toss salmon carcasses? For the 137 vertebrate species that rely on Pacific salmon. Here they are. There are lots of different species, including bald eagles, ospreys, great blue heron, as well as other birds, uh, fierce predators like grizzly bears, black bears, gray wolf, foxes, and even marine animals like the killer whale, the river otter, western pond turtle, and the sea lion, to name a few. Salmon are a keystone species. 
which means they have a disproportionately large effect on their environment relative to their abundance. In other words, even though their populations are relatively small, the health of salmon impacts the health of many other species as well. To help explain this a little more, we can use the bridge metaphor. Salmon are the middle stone of a bridge, holding the rest of the stones, or the 137 vertebrates that rely on salmon, up. What would happen if we removed a stone from the bridge? Well, the rest of the bridge tumbles down. So without salmon, many other species would not be able to survive. So where do we get the salmon carcasses from? The Clear Creek Hatchery. The Nisqually tribe's Clear Creek Hatchery is where the salmon carcasses are provided from. Eggs are taken from the females and milt is taken from the males. So the hatchery is able to fertilize the eggs and create a new generation of salmon. Once the eggs and milt are taken, and the salmon is deceased, salmon carcasses are frozen, just like this. So why do we freeze the carcass? Well, it helps to kill diseases and parasites that naturally occur in the salmon, like Nanophytus salmoncola. This is a bacterium that causes salmon poisoning disease, a fatal disease of dogs. And because we have to freeze them in these big blocks and we can't really toss a giant block like this straight into the stream, we have to break them up. So this is Nano from the Clear Creek Hatchery breaking up a block of ice using a forklift. There have been 20 years of carcass tossing with this program starting in 1999 for a total of 175 tons of salmon tossed or more than 350,000 pounds, with about 14,000 pounds this year. During salmon tossing, you might notice the tails of the salmon have been cut off. So why do we cut off the tails? Well, there are biologists from the Department of Fish and Wildlife in the tribe that hike each salmon bearing tributary in the watershed to survey for spawning activity. By cutting the tails off, that lets the scientists know that those were delivered by us and not natural spawners. Here are some more pictures of the salmon tossing process. So most importantly for you students is to be prepared. We will be going out rain or shine, so be prepared with rain gear and rain boots, preferably rain gear that you don't mind getting dirty and stinky. Along with that, be sure to wear warm layers and bring a change of clothes for your outer layer after the trip. Make sure you bring a plastic bag for stinky clothes because we'll be handling fish, so the chances of you getting stinky and dirty are pretty high. Thanks again for allowing me to present to you on our salmon tossing trips. We're so excited for this trip. Have fun and see you out there.